Hey guys, it's Robin RS Island Crafts and welcome to my craft room. In today's video, we are going to be doing quilt as you go log cabins, but when we do them this time, instead of just doing the fabric onto the batting, I have a backing and we're gonna quilt it all the way through. I'm just gonna make a little mini wall hanging, just a 12 and a half inch block to test out this design and to show you guys how I do it. So I've chosen my backing fabric. I have these little trick-or-treating devils. When I first purchased this at Joann's, I thought, wow, they're so fun. But then as I come to realize, it's not easy to use in a lot of different designs. Once you make a bag out of it, it's, it's a specific person who would enjoy this. I think it might be just a little bit too busy for some people. So I have the few little chunks left over. So anyways, I just thought I'd go ahead and use this as the backing. I have my 100% cotton batting. This is the warm and white because we will be ironing as we go on this. So I've cut this out to be just a little bit over the 12 and a half inches. I gave it what, about an inch all the way around, give or take. It doesn't have to be specific, but as you can see, there's a little bit of room all the way around it. And I also cut my fabric the same size. What I did, all I did is you can either cut out your fabric or your batting first and then lay the one on top of the other. I cut my fabric, laid it on a chunk of batting and just trimmed around it. Now when you're doing small little, you could do many, many blocks of these. I'm just going to do the one little wall hanging so we can see the techniques. I'm not going to show you how to put different squares together or anything like that. Video. I do want to try all the different quilt as you go techniques on how to make them and put them together. But for today only, we're just going to do a log cabin quilt as you go. Now you can go ahead and do it like we did with the, the herring bones and just make our 12 and a half inch square instead of a rectangle. Just go ahead and stitch your fabric right to the batting. But since we've already done that once, I thought for anyone else who wants to make a small wall hanging in a quilt as you go style, we would go ahead and do it with the backing this time. So I have my backing. I ironed it all out nice and neat. I wanted to make sure there was no wrinkles. I went ahead and ironed my batting. What I actually did is I kept these two together. The cotton sticks to the cotton really well. So I just pressed it really good this way with some steam. I flipped it over and I did it this way. I have a hint of a shadow from the crease. This was one of those packages where the batting comes all folded up. It's good. As they say, that little bit will quilt out. Now one of the tips that they tell you is to hold these two together instead of putting pins in everywhere to use that 505 basting spray. That stuff is really strong and it smells a lot and it, the overspray makes everything sticky so you have to be really careful with it. Now I have asthma and even I tried doing this outside and it's just it's just too strong and too much for me. So I don't want to put pins everywhere and have to deal with taking them out. So I'm going to try something today. I'm going to try using a little Elmer's washable school glue. It's a glue stick and I'm going to try putting some glue on my my fabric here and then do my project and see if that helps at all. So if you don't want to use the basting spray or you don't want to spend the money on it, you might have a different technique that you can use. I don't know if it's ever done before, but I'm sure someone has tried it, right? So what I'm going to do, so I'll separate these and I'm going to put it right to the fabric. The batting tends to be lumpy, bumpy and absorbent, and it'll probably soak up more of the glue than I really need. So I'm just going to put some, oh my goodness, it's brand new. I'm going to put some onto my fabric and then I'm going to use a hot iron and set the glue. Now I've seen them use glue sticks and regular the white Elmer school glue to do the bindings. When you go to bring it over to the front or the back and you're going to machine stitch your binding or even hand sew, I guess you could do it. They use either glue sticks or the little white bottles of school glue. So if it works for that, it should work for this too, right? And it's purple so we can see where we're putting it. I think I'll just do some straight lines down. Come through, whoop, there goes my straight lines. As you're pulling down on it, it kind of glops, so you gotta kind of rotate it around. And 
And of course, because you got glue on it, it is sticky. Just make sure I have it everywhere. If you want to try new techniques like this, this is something that it's good to try it on. Just something small you can turn. Since we're using this as a Halloween theme, you can use this on your table. Put Use like a candle mat or put a candy dish on it or something. So if you just want to try a new technique out, it's always good to start on something small instead of committing yourself to something big. And go easy on the glue because it comes out pretty good once you start rubbing it. And then it sticks to everything. Okay. Now they say when you're using this glue that you need to go ahead and set it with your iron. And get my batting on there all nice and neat. One thing that's good about the glue is it's uh, repositionable. So if you don't have it exactly where you want it, you can go ahead and move things around. Smooth it out. And since we put the glue on the fabric, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and press from there. I don't know if you're supposed to use a dry iron or a steam, but I tend to use steam for everything. Unless somebody yells at me and tells me not to do it no more. And then I'll probably still do it anyway. Robin the Rebel. I can't imagine that it takes very long to set the glue. What this is going to do is as we're moving around and we're quilting, because since we're quilting as we go, when we put our fabric down, we're going to stitch right through all three layers. You really don't want anything to shift on the back and get wrinkles and puckers and tucks and stuff. So hopefully, if this works, we're going to know really soon once we start doing it, that it will hold everything together. And I won't have to put pins because if I don't use the spray and I don't use the glue, I'm going to have to put pins all throughout here. And since we're only working on a 12 and a half inch square, that, that's going to be putting a few pins in and constantly having to take them out. Because as we did the wonky log cabins before, we're still going to be doing that same uh, rectangular square spiral. I mean, spirals in a circle, can it still be a spiral if you're doing like this in straight lines? A squared off spiral maybe whatever so I have this all set I'm gonna go ahead and just let this sit for a few minutes and cool I do kind of yeah I'm kind of that type that likes to peek ahead of time can you see it's I'm pulling on it but it's it's kind of gently just pulling because I don't need to rip it off it is you see how it's kind of sticking and holding it together there? So I think it should do what we want. Our main concern really is going to be mostly in the center because we are going to be trimming this to 12 and a half inches. So that outer inch or inch and a half is really not going to matter if it comes up a little bit loose. So I'm going to let this sit and let's talk about fabric. You can plan this out really well with your colors since you know you're going to have, we're going to use a two and a half inch square for the center. And I went ahead and I fussy cut that. I'm going to be using this little pumpkin. This part of another, this was another circle over here. This fabric had all these circle, I think it's called button fabric or something. They had circles everywhere with different Halloween things in it. I thought this one was nice and bright to have in the center. Look at that. Okay, so we're going to have that right in the center, and then I'm going to build my logs all around it. So I just went ahead, and I went with two and a half inch strips. I just pulled out some of my Halloween fabric that I have left. I'm getting close towards the almost end of it, so every time I make something Halloween, it's all about the same fabrics now, but that's okay. We're just going to make a little testing today. So I have oranges and I have some blacks and I have some of this from the back that we can use on the front to bring it all together. Some of my fabric is directional so I can try to put this on the top or bottom. I can still put it on the side and let it go sideways. It is okay. You're not going to need too much fabric for this. You can always cut your fabric as you go. As always, we're going to need some shorter ones like this. 
and then you're going to need some longer ones and we're just going to be building it out you can kind of lay it out like this to see how you want it to look i wouldn't trim anything yet just to give yourself an idea of how it's going to look you can alternate you can just use two fabrics and make each log around you can have like with a regular log cabin you can have all your darks on one side and all your lights on the other they're really like i said before these are the uh, the choices are endless you can make such a variety of things today we're just going to learn a technique and then i'll have a little wall hanging or a table topper Once again, I try not to use my longer strips in the beginning unless I know this fabric specifically that I want to have right here. And I know I have enough of it. I only cut a just a probably about 14 inches of different fabrics. Like I said, some of the shorter ones, some of the longer ones. A nice little variety because we're only going to need a couple. The very first one's going to be the shortest because that's going to be two and a half by two and a half still because we're only going up here, but afterwards it's going to increase by what, two and a half every time? So I just went through, like I said, I just chose some fabrics. You can do this in Christmas and Easter. You can just do it in your favorite colors. And if you're gonna make multiple of them, then you can make every single block the same or different. I'm sure there's calculators out there that tell you how much fabric you need to do log cabin blocks and for what design, and there's plenty of patterns. There's there's tons of free ones on Pinterest, plus you can also purchase them at many different websites that have them. But today we're just going to play. Our next step is to, like I said, this is cooling off. I think it's about ready. We're going to go ahead and head over to the sewing machine and I'll show you how I stitch this. I'm going to show you two different ways. I'm going to show you the way we did the, the herringbone ones where we're just going to stitch down here. And then I'm also going to show you a way that we can do extra quilting as we're building our logs as we go round and round. To the sewing machine. We're gonna have to deal with a little bit of shadowing here and there. We do have a lot of light. There's a light under here and a light under here. So we're doing pretty good there. I just have to order my desk lamp that I can put over here and get rid of those shadows and stuff. But I think we'll be okay for today. Now I have my little pumpkin in the center. I'm going to go ahead and take my glue stick and just put a little dab in it just to hold it in its spot. You can do the trick to where you fold it in half, kind of feel a little bit of a crease in the center there. Fold it back in half the other way and it'll just give you about an idea where your center mark is. Just a little dab of glue, it's not going to take much. Add my pumpkin in the center. If you hear any sneezing and coughing, you'll just have to excuse my husband. He has his, he seems to have an afternoon sneezing, coughing fit every day. I'm gonna go ahead and make my log cabin all straight and no wonky, but as I'm going through the process, I will show you how you can easily wonkify it. Now, if you don't wanna do it the way we were doing it the other day and taking straight strips and making them wonky, because that's basically what we're gonna do today, you can also take your strips and just cut them wonky so you don't have a straight two and a half by two and a half. You can taper it down, chop off an angle, however you wanna do it. So like this guy here, ooh, he's a little thin. We can see through him, but he won't be bad on top of the batting. If we wanted to make him wonky, we can just grab our scissors. You can use your rotary cutter, but I'm sitting right here at the sewing machine. And when I stitch this down, it's gonna automatically make it a wonky. I can either stitch it on the angle or I can stitch it on there. And then as we're going around, it'll keep making it wonky. But for now, we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna do this straight. And if you did want to wonky it, just like when we did it with the regular log cabins last week with the monsters, instead of stitching it straight like this, you can go ahead and just stitch it at an angle. Now when we're stitching these on, we're only going to be stitching as far as the piece that is here. We don't want to stitch the extra and have it stitched down to here. Well, we're, I'll show you when we do it, but what we do is we're going to trim it so that it's even with the piece that we're stitching it to. Okay. 
I'm gonna start now. My pumpkin's he's a little on diagonal in my in my little block, but I'm gonna start up at the top here like I did before, and I'm gonna work my way around clockwise. I think I'm gonna go ahead and put my witch. Even though the words are upside down, I'm gonna go ahead and put it so my witch is right side up. I didn't cut any of my, none of my strips have a straight edge. Well, this one sort of does, but as you can see, it's not quite straight there. So I'm not gonna go exactly from end to end. I wanna go a little bit past still, and then I'll trim it up. Actually, I think I do like it with the witches, right, the white ray. So I'm gonna put that down here to make sure I'm gonna go in there. What I can do with this one is I can go ahead and take my scissors and just line it up along this block right here and then cut myself a nice little straight edge. That way I can line it up on this one side. I should be completely honest with you guys here. I have never done this specific process. I've seen it done in a lot of videos, but as of hands-on, we're gonna be practicing it together. Now I, what I would do is I would go ahead and stitch this seam here and then stop at the end of my block. But that, that would automatically, since you put that stitch in, it would make it quilted and it would be all the way through and secure. But what I want to do this time is I saw one, let me get this out of the way, I saw one where they did their straight line quilting a lot in here so it becomes a very dense project. And that works if you're doing just like I'm doing just one piece here. So I'm going to put a ton of, well, I'm going to put a bunch of lines in here. I, I'm not going to be spacing them far apart. I'm going to probably keep them, I don't know, maybe I'll only do them about a quarter inch apart. And then as I'm going around, I'll do that. And I can do that with this machine because it has an automatic thread cutter. So when I get to the end, I can just cut the threads. And then that way I don't have to constantly be cutting threads and burying them. You can do it with a standard sewing machine. You're just gonna have all of your top threads are gonna be up at the top and your bobbins down at the bottom. And then you just have to pull it through. So if you pull out a little bobbin thread, the top thread usually pulls back to the back of your quilt with you. I didn't think about it, but I have yellow thread in my machine, and since I have some yellow fabrics and it's a Halloween quilt, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it, but a you could use a black thread or an orange or whatever, depending on what fabric you're using and how it works for your quilt. I'm going to go ahead and bring it to the top. You'll have to excuse me while I try to figure out where all the buttons are. Most of the buttons on the machines are basically in the same spot but sometimes you gotta do a little searching. And then I just come back up and I can go press her foot away if I'd like. This machine is really neat because it can cut the thread with the foot pedal. All you do is put your heel back onto it and then it cuts the thread, which is really kind of cool. If I go past the block just a little bit, the end of the fabric, it is not a problem. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. I think I got my first line a little wonky, so all of them are going a little off. So while my, my quilt might be straight, my stitching will be crazy. That's okay. I saw this when someone was making pot holders using the log cabin design like this, and I thought it was really kind of cool. Okay, go ahead and trim these threads off. I'm not gonna worry about it being perfect. These little ends are gonna be covered by the piece that I put on now. So now I can lay my piece down. I'm gonna see that I can go right to here. Now I can add a pin to that. If you put a pin right where your thread, your fabric ends, and you'll know to go ahead and stop right there. 
it's not going to be a big crisis if you go past it because you're just going to put the next piece of fabric on top of that. So now you can take this to your, sew to your ironing station and you can go ahead and press this down or you can just finger press it. And then I'm just going to take my scissors and I'm going to go ahead and trim that up a little bit. Now my quilting is going to go this way. So I'm going to do the same thing I did there, but I'm going to do it this way. And that's going to end up giving me that straight line spiral. I guess we can call it that, right? Make sure this is all folded down. And it seems like gluing the batting and the fabric together, it seems to be holding it pretty well right now. As I explained once before, hubby and I eat our big meal at noon. So I had done this before noon, did my dishes, made the dinner and all that. And it's, it's nice and dry and it feels very secure. It's holding it nicely. I can not easily pull it apart because it is just stick glue, but it's working nice. If after putting that one on, if I decided that I'd like to have my stitch a little bit closer, I can always sneak another one in. In the overall scheme of things, when you're done, it's not gonna be as noticeable because you're gonna have a big 12 inch block. You can also use some type of a decorative stitch if you'd like. If you had one of those metal bars that come off that you can use as a guideline, you can do that too. Or you can just do like I am and just free form it and decide. I'm just trying to line it up with the side of my presser foot. Now I'm going to need a piece of fabric that is going to go from the top all the way down to here. And I have one of these. Go ahead and give it just a slight trim so it feels like it's almost even. I guess I could have done this ahead of time with my rotary cutter, but like I said, I didn't really think about how this was going to work until I started doing it. And then I can just, I'm going to use my presser foot to hold my fabric, and I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to go ahead and trim it even with the bottom of my block. It may get a little bit stretched out while you're doing all that straight line stitching or it might stay perfectly fine. I don't know. And then I'll just stitch down this piece. Now you see how I have that little bit of fabric sticking up out there? I'm not going to worry about that. It's, it's all stitched down. It's not going to flop anywhere. It's not going to show through this fabric. If you had some white fabric, it might be a concern. Now my stitching went this way. You see how I'm a little short there on my stitching? I have a thread sticking up. I'm going to catch that when I do my quarter inch. So my thread went to up and down, went this way. So I'm going back this way. I'm going to go up and down again. This time I'm going to go a little closer to where my seam is, where my, my stitch in the ditch area or whatever you want to call it, just to keep it a little bit closer. Because I, I realized down here that I didn't like it too far away. I'm going to go ahead and keep adding these stitches, making sure it's laying flat as I'm stitching it, and then we'll go over and we'll do the next piece. Now if we chose to do this, let's say we chose to do our block in oranges and yellows. So we have the oranges which would be on the top and the left, then we would have the yellows on the right and the bottom. So if I had a yellow here, if I wanted to do the orange and yellow scheme, when I go over to this way, I would want to make sure that I picked up one of my yellow piles. So if you're doing separate colors like a light and dark, you want to make sure you keep your pile separate. I'm not doing light and dark. I'm just doing, hmm, this looks good.
Now, if you can see, my yellow is just a little bit longer than my original black from my pumpkin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure when I put my piece on that I see a little bit of this coming through that I go even with my shorter piece. That way I don't have any backing sticking out. I'm sorry, I don't have any batting sticking out. You can put a pin in here if you'd like. If this makes you more comfortable, you can go ahead and pop a pin in there. And you see how I have just this little bit of my yellow peeking through here. I have a little bit of black popping through, so that is no problem. I make sure that this top piece is either even with my last piece or going just a bit past it. And go ahead and do a few stitches. Then I can cut this one if I'd like. Just fold it back. Put my scissors in there. Just, you just have to be careful you're not cutting any of your batting. That would be a problem. We can fix it, but we don't want to have to fix things all the time. So if you wanted to, you could take this over to your iron, to your pressing station, and you can go ahead and press that out. But for this type, with all this extra quilting we're putting into it, I don't see a problem with just folding it over by hand. Because once I put this first row of quilting in, it holds it in place and it keeps it from being uh, wrinkled and offset. Just when you get up here, you want to make sure you're pushing your threads to the back of your machine and you're not bringing them forward because then you've got to pick them out of your stitches. Now this is why I like the drop-in bobbins because I can just go ahead and see right now when I pull my piece out or as I'm stitching, I can just go ahead and look up, look underneath it and peek and I can see that I have plenty of bobbin left. Now if it was one of those, those the, whatever the regular bobbins where they go on the side of the machine, you'd have to take things off and pull it out and put it back in or just hope you don't run out while you're sewing because I don't really like to run out when I'm in the middle of the quilting lines. Now we're going to keep rotating and it's the same process with the other log cabins. I have two seams here so this is where I want to put it. I have this, I have my um, my clouds and all that and you can tell a lot of this is Joanne's fabrics. You could see how you could see through it a little bit. Now this might not be very good to use for a regular quilt. They say if you could see your hands through it then it's not going to last very long. But for something like this, for pot holders, hot pads, for something that I'm super quilting like this, it, it's not going to, this one for me is not going on a child's bed. I don't feel concerned about using this. On a wall hanging, how often are you really going to wash it? Before I get too long, I'm going to bring my scissors here. And if I line my scissors up, can you see where I'm at? If I line my scissors up so that the blade is right along this edge, then when I snip it, that piece of fabric should be just about right along there. See how that worked out? You can make candle mats and table toppers like this and it'll work really well for the different holidays. You can practice your different blocks and your different stitches. See how fabrics work together. They make really good gifts. You could practice your skills and then give it as a gift. If you didn't put any backing on this, you could use this for the front of a tote bag. Or any type of bag. You can, you can make a purse out of it. You can make a project bag. Even with the backing, if... Oh, we just learned some lessons, Robin Suzanne. Let me show you my lesson. See, this is why we practice, right? Can 
you see where I cut all my threads? There they are. Hmm. That's a lesson to learn. I'm going to have to take my little snips and trim that. I wonder how these people did it. I wonder if they did this without the backing and they just did it with the quilt, the quilt batting and their fabric and then they put the backing on. It's been a while since I watched the video. That's okay. Once again, we've learned a lesson. I've made the mistake before you did. So before we do any of our quilting, we can bring both threads to the top. If I bring both threads to the top on this one, we'll see what our back looks like after this. I was just trying to be skipping a step. Cut my thread. Bring it to the top. This is a good way to use up that extra thread that you no longer need. I'm going to put one more on here even though we don't need it just because I want to see if it solves that problem. Okay, there we go. There's our last few. There are no thread there because duh, you cannot be lazy. I know better. If you don't bring your thread to the top, it sometimes leaves a little bird's nest. So if we always bring our thread to the top first, that'll be bringing our bobbin thread to the top. Then we won't have any of this little messy bird's nest on here that I'm now going to have to go through and clean up. So now that you guys already seen my mistake, you won't make the same mistake. See how it works when we're learning together? told you guys I would go ahead and practice with you and if I ever make any mistakes that I will make sure that I leave them on video so that you can see that and avoid that mistake yourself. Now there's a good chance you're going to find your own mistakes and make something totally new and then you can come back here and leave a comment on the video so that the next person doesn't make that mistake and that's how we're all going to learn together. Okay. So I'm going to keep building this out like you've seen. It's going to take me a while because of all this extra lines of quilting that I've put in. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. Before I do it though, I want to show you how you can make a wonky. I won't be stitching it down, but I want you to see. So we've got our straight rounds here already. Now if I wanted to go ahead and make it wonky, I would go ahead and take this and trim it like that. Now this is going to leave that extra bulk of fabric behind my seam. Let me put a pin in it so we can see. You see how I'm going to have this extra fabric right here along the edge when I fold it back? The extra bulk here is not going to matter for a candle mat or a table topper, but if you had a, you have to be careful because you can't put a white fabric on here and have this fabric shadowing through. So it just becomes, if you want it to be wonky, you need to be careful of your fabric choice and placement. And maybe this style of it is not a good idea for you. You might need to go to the original non-quilt as you go. And then you can go ahead and wonkify it all you need. But for this one, I'm going to keep going straight. I have mostly my straight lines of quilting and that'll help out. So I'm going to go ahead and pause you guys here. Like I said, I'll finish it up and then we'll come back and look at it. So I kept going round and round and round. This is the way we started. And as you can see, now folding it while sitting at the machine and talking to you and going like this did not give me the exact center. When you pick your center square, you need to make sure that you're measuring it to get the exact center if it's a concern to you that it's exact. As you can see, mine came a little bit wonky. I have, I have three here when I was doing it. I ended up just stitching some of them together and I had I just used it round and round and round so I do have two of my pumpkins here but I kind of like it that way but I have three here and three here but then I've got one two three four here so I am a little bit off balance and when I go ahead whoops when I go ahead and put my 12 inch down onto here 
I kind of have to move it around a little bit just to get it to where it's in there. But I decided since I'm going to make this as a candle mat, that I will just go ahead and skip to cutting it to 12 inches square. And I'm just going to trim it up and make it an even square-ish rectangle. We'll see how it looks when I start trimming it. I did go through and I, I picked out all the pieces of extra thread. I used a needle and then I just used these little snippers so I can snip really close. And I just went ahead and I trimmed all my threads. And you can see that there was a bunch of them. Lint rolled them off. So once again, we've learned something. We've learned that you need to remember just because you got a new sewing machine that you shouldn't forget all the old rules that you already know because they still apply to the new machine that you should bring your thread to the top so that you don't have the bobbin thread at the bottom at the bottom of your project because we all know that if you leave it down there you get bird's nest and if you're doing a quilt as you go and you keep doing this with your hands that you're going to end up with a whole bunch of thread on the bottom it's okay it cleaned up really well i mean if you're going to get nitpicky and look right in there i could probably clean it up a little bit more if i were sending this as a gift I would go ahead and make sure all these little bits, I probably actually, if I was gonna send this as a gift, I would have stopped as soon as I saw it, set this aside, and I would have started all over again. But since this was for me and this was a practice piece, I wanted to make sure that I left my mistakes in so that you guys don't make those same mistakes. Because that's part of what this channel is. I want you guys to know that if you make a mistake, there are ways to fix it. If you're making this for you, the way to fix it was to pull those little threads out. If you were making this for a gift, let's say you made the entire piece, then you flipped it over and you went, oh my God, Robin, look at what I did. There's a way to fix that still. Go ahead and put another piece of fabric on the back and cover this all right up. No one will ever see it. Now, since I used a crazy fabric, you want, might wanna make sure you use something darker so none of this shadows through but you can go ahead and just recover the back of it. And then it'll be a quilt as you go as we did the herringbone. Now the back would be loose, yes, but you can go through and you can stitch in the ditch. You can start in the center and then just follow all of these lines all the way around and that would reattach a new back to your piece. Or you could totally say, that's it, I've had enough and just throw it away and start all over again but I wouldn't throw it away because you could cut these into little pieces and make coasters out of them. You can take a little, well, I would make my coasters five inches. So you can take your ruler, you can cut five inch squares out, you can cut the six and a half inch squares if you'd like, and then do the method where you put a new back on it, you put the uh, new piece of fabric right sides together, stitch all the way around, leave a little spot, pull it all out, stitch all around again, and then you would have coasters. So you would never actually waste your fabric. I'm gonna go ahead and trim this up so that it comes something legible of, we'll, we're, we're kind of hoping for some form of a square. What have we got? It is 13 by 15. So if we want a square, we have to do it 13 by 13. I think we're gonna end up with a rectangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take I'm going to take my seam that's running right here between these two fabrics. I'm going to find a line on my ruler. It just so happens that it's the two inch one and that allows me to have some of the fabric along the edge here. And then I have this straight line. So this is going to straighten it up based off of that seam. This is the method I use when I'm squaring up my quilt when I'm all done and getting ready to put the binding on. When I come to these pieces, I have my salvage here. Now I wanna go ahead and cut this salvage off. If it was further into the project and there was actual batting all the way through, I might even leave that in because I don't mind. If it's something that has fun words or little, some of them might have little ghosts on it or something, that would be fun to leave in the project. I'm going to square it up using my, I just made this, this edge right here nice of a straight line. So I'm gonna use that to square up here. I'm just kinda guess on where I wanna be. I can use this line of stitches here. I just might have to pull this out just a little bit 
because sometimes the fabric sneaks under your, your ruler. So if you pull it out, I can line up down at the base of my project and I can line up on that stitch line. If you hadn't have done all this extra quilting stitches like I did, then you would want to go ahead and press your project really good. Go ahead and run a nice hot steamy iron over it to make sure everything's laying nice. And you might want to go ahead and put a little stay stitch all around. And that's just, you can use a long stitch if you'd like, or you can just use your regular stitch. And it just holds all this fabric down and it makes it stay where it needs to be, a stay stitch. Now I know my lines here, these seams are not straight at all. So I won't be lining up against that. I'm going to inadvertently have a little bit of a wonky candle mat just because of the way everything went round and round. You guys know I like wonky, so that's not gonna hurt my feelings. And once again, this one's not gonna line up straight either. So I'll just choose the smallest amount here, line it up on my bottom. I got some trash. So there's my little candle mat. I still need to put some binding around the edges, but I brought out, I got one of these candles at Michael's. This is delicious apple and oh, it smells just like red apple. My husband Rob and I, we do not like the perfumey scented things. We, we actually don't use candles. We use those wax melting things. But I got this giant candle. This is 17 ounces. I got it at Michael's. It was on sale and I ended up getting it, I think, for $2.50. But what I do, let me pop this open. Mmm, it just smells so good. I use, I have an old fork and a butter knife that I just dig out chunks of the candle and I put it into my little waxer and you're going to get a lot more than you would get when you buy those little cubes and stuff and pick them up at Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond or whatever. So for $2.50, I usually spend, so a lot of times they're $2.99, they were $4.99 for the pack of six or eight at Michael's of this same scent. So for $2.50, I've got multiple, multiple uses. So we're going to go up soon and pick up before Halloween, pick up some more of these because we really like the way the scent throws through the entire house. In two hours, our whole house, granted it's not that big, it's 1,200 square feet, but it smells so good. I'm sure most of you guys know that trick, but if you didn't know that trick, now you do. With my asthma, I can't have candles. It's the strangest thing when you... When the candle is blown out, even if I don't blow it out, it does something, they say, like it sucks the air out of the area of the room and stuff like that. And it just sends me into a coughing asthma fit every time, and then I'm in bad shape for the rest of the day. So we just put these, we just put these in our little ma uh, wax melter, and the scent just travels so much farther than if it was just a candle. You can do this with the... If, when I go to the Dollar Tree and I buy those little shot glass candles, we just set that right on top of our warmer and because it has the dish you can take out and then it has a flat spot and it just melts it right in there. I melt it a couple times till the sun, the scent doesn't travel anymore and then we throw it away. But this one, there's if I had to put this in and waited for this whole thing to melt, it's just too much. So I just take an old knife, like I said, an old fork. You can go pick one up at the Dollar Tree or something and I melt it. Works great. Now back to our project. Oh, the whole point was to put it on the little candle mat. Ta-da! Now I don't burn candles like I said, so I don't know, is it safe to put a candle onto something like this? This is 100% cotton, but I don't have anything heat resistant in it. I know if it was a candle that drips, most people would have it on a plate, but do you put your glass candles right on a surface like this? So I also did not pay attention when this is my up and down for my front and my up and down is going this way on my back. It's not like you can see both sides at the same time, right? So now it's reversible. It measures, it's about 12 and a half inches by 13 and three quarters. Nobody said they have to be square either, right? This is what happens when you're just taking your scraps and you're just playing and being creative. This is a great way to get used to the process of getting your quarter inch because if you don't get an exact quarter inch, it's going to be okay. You could practice your quilt as you go. 
you're going to get some practice putting your binding on a project this small. I know we all want to jump right into that king size or full size, queen size, whatever quilt for our bed, but sometimes it's better to learn the techniques on something small like this, to learn the binding on this, than it is to learn it on a big quilt. What I might do is I might go ahead and set this aside and then we can go ahead and learn how to put binding on. We haven't done that together yet, right? Another thing I want to let you guys know is the upcoming Friday for a sew with me video, we're not going to actually be sewing. I need to go ahead and take a week off of this type of video. I have a few projects that are that I'm in a time crunch for that I need to actually get done. I need to get a few things caught up and get back on track. I've gotten so far off my routine for making these videos, but don't worry, you're still gonna get a video on Friday. It's just not going to be a sewing video. I've had a few requests for, some people want to see the, the way I'm now hanging the quilts on my wall. I've had a couple other requests on how I store some of my fabric scraps. So next week's video is going to be a little show and tell and a little chatting, a little Q&A type situation. And that'll give me some time to catch up on some of my projects. I also need some time. I think I have it figured out. I spent one day Sunday last week and I did a whole bunch, about an hour and a half of how to do the embroidery. And I was showing you the different stitches, but then when I was watching it back, it was just trash. I deleted all those videos. I think I have an idea on how I can get it to work for me. I have to order a desk lamp first so we can get some extra light on the scene, and then I can go ahead and start working on that. So there's gonna be a lot of things coming in the near future. You'll still get your Talk To Me Tuesday and Whip It Wednesday, so you're gonna have plenty of videos to watch. And just like a few of you are already doing, and thank you very much, you can go back and watch some of the older videos. Okay guys, until next time, thanks for hanging out with me in the craft room. Bye.